Today I'm going to talk about neural networks. Now, the first thing you need to understand is that an artificial neural network is totally different from a real neural network. The order of magnitudes are completely different. Um, brains are much, much, much bigger. And there's a massive number of neurons in your brain, and they're connected by a ton of synapses, which are the connections between neurons. These are, um, and the signals that travel through your brain, they're called spikes. They're spikes of electrical potential. And artificial neural networks, they're just totally different. They're much smaller. They're not nearly as interconnected. And the spikes are totally different, right? Artificial neural networks, they calculate like calculators. It's, it's you know, every, um, every calculation is perfect. Whereas with humans, it's not like that. Um, we're just totally different. Um, anyway, so artificial neural networks were just inspired by brains. Um, but in any case, they're very popular for computer vision because they can handle really challenging computer vision problems um, that other methods can't handle. And um, if you, you know, if you give them a, a tons and tons of data and a problem with computer vision, they can do things that other methods can't. And they're particularly good for problems where um, the data lie on thin, like these kind of skinny manifolds in feature space. So if you think about the manifold of natural images, which I've kind of illustrated here, if you change one pixel in um, an image, like if you make that pixel, for instance, bright blue, like I have one pixel there that's, that's changed color, um, then all of a sudden that image is no longer a natural image. It no longer lies on the natural manifold of, the, the manifold of natural images. And so, uh, so anyway, that's, that's the kind of problem that neural networks are really good for, where the data lie along these thin manifolds in feature space. And, and most data sets, um, most data sets for like healthcare and criminal justice and uh, other types of problems, um, they don't have these characteristics. So there's, there's only, there's very specific types of data where neural networks just succeed where other methods can't. And it's, it's, it's this type of problem where the, where the data lie on these, these thin manifolds in feature space. Okay, so this is a neuron. This is a neuron called me. It's an artificial neuron. And me does a special kind of computation. And me sees as input all of the outputs of the other neurons that feed into it, weighted by their connectivity. Okay, so what does me do with all these inputs? It adds them up. And um, I'm going to put a little summation there, but it, what, it, what it actually means is this. It means that it sums up the outputs of the other neurons weighted by their connectivity. And then that sum feeds into an activation function, which is something that um, you can, for now, uh, if we're following the biological perspective, then it would be something that's usually between, it's an increasing function between zero and one. And it's supposed to look like a threshold function. Okay, so it's supposed to look kind of like, like a function that's like a threshold. And, um, so there's the activation of the sum right there. Uh, and the value of the activation function is actually, um, is actually the output of the neuron. Okay, so I'm gonna call it O, o, o of me because this is the output of this neuron. Um, and then that of course feeds into the other neurons that are waiting for it, weighted by the connection strength. So you can think about this activation function um, is kind of being inspired by a step function. So the idea is that if you have enough input feeding into this neuron, then the neuron fires, right? You, you hit the other side of that step function. But in reality, um, activation functions do not look exactly like step functions. Um, in reality, they, they look like, um, they, they can be all different things and I'll talk about that later. But in any case, let's, let's just go with the, the biological uh, perspective here. And we're going to work with the step function for just a few minutes. Okay, so we're going to work with the step function and we're going to feed the feed in the outputs of other neurons. Um, there are three other neurons connecting to this neuron. Their weights are 1, 1, and 1.5. The third neuron that um, whose output comes into me uh, that his output is always negative one. So you can think about that as kind of like an intercept term for a linear model or something like that. It's just always minus one. And we're gonna change up the uh, O1 and O2 and see what happens, see what this neuron actually computes. Okay, so 
what if O1 and O2 are both zero? So in that case, I'm supposed to compute zero times one plus zero times one from the two neurons at the top and then a negative one times 1.5. That total is negative. That doesn't surpass zero, which is the threshold. And so the output is zero. The neuron does not spike. Okay, so let's say that I make W1 equal to one. So what happens then? So in that case, I have one times one plus zero plus negative 1.5. And again, that sum not positive. So neuron doesn't spike. Okay, uh, then if we swap it out where O, O1 is zero, O2 is one. It's, the whole thing is symmetric, so the neuron doesn't spike. But then if, if both neurons, uh, if, if O1 and O2 are both one, then um, that's the tipping point, right? <laughs> then the sum is one plus one minus 1 1.5. That is actually greater than zero. And so the neuron spikes and that's cool. So the neuron, neuron fires. So in other words, we have a model, we have a function here that computes and. Okay, so if both of these things are one, if both of O1 and O2 are one, then me computes one, otherwise zero. Okay, so this is the AND function. Now, there are OR neurons and there are also NOT neurons. And in fact, if you put a bunch of neurons together, you can model all kinds of interesting logical statements. And that's, that's kind of a cool thing about these neurons. These, they're very, very flexible, right? If you, as long as you're allowed to choose uh, you know, the different weights and the different step functions, you can compute a lot, a lot of stuff. You can put all kinds of logical expressions into this. All right. Now, for doing machine learning, I'm just going to stick with the, uh, the, the soft activation function for now, although to be honest, um, other kinds of activation functions have been, have gotten popular recently. But um, we're going to use the, right now we're going to use this kind of soft activation function uh, kind of similar to the one where that we were talking about when we were talking about logistic regression, right? Where they thought human populations would saturate a country and so they were modeling that saturation. Anyway, so here's the sigmoid for you. We're going to use that as, as the activation function. Okay, and there's a picture of it. Cool. Okay, so here's the neuron. It adds up the weighted inputs and sends the sum through the sigmoid and gets an output. So let's say that this particular neuron comes at the end of a 10 layer neural network, and this is neural, neuron 100. This is the, the very last neuron in the network. And there are uh, a, a bunch of neurons feeding into it. They're called 99, 98, 97, all the way down to 90, whatever. Okay, so um, how does a neural network learn? Well, we have to give it some feedback to learn from. So right now we're gonna do supervised regression and we're gonna use the squared loss. So what we can do is look at what the neuron was supposed to predict for one particular output, right? We can look at the error on, on a particular output. So this is the error on um, a, a something it was supposed, it was supposed to predict Y, it predicted O100. And so the error is that quantity right there. Um, so now that we have that information, how are we going to learn from it? And that is what the backpropagation algorithm is for. Now in a brain, the synapses strengthen and weaken in order to learn. Let's say that the same thing happens here. And so the question then is how should we set the weights in order to learn? Um, in other words, how do we set the weights in, or, in order to reduce the error? So we're going to minimize the error with respect to the choice of those weights. Okay. So let's talk about backpropagation, which is the way that we essentially do gradient descent on that error. Okay, so backprop is an algorithm that trains the weights of a neural network. It requires us to propagate information backward through the network and then forwards and then backwards and then forwards. So we're propagating gradients backward and then we're making predictions as we go forward. Now propagating backward is exactly equal to the chain rule from calculus and I'm going to show you how that works in the next video. Thanks.